Okay, so uh, in the previous segment, we talked about question answering systems in general. In the new segment, I'm going to talk about evaluation of question answering systems. How do we figure out that the system works well and how can we improve it? So let me start first by focusing on a specific type of question answering evaluation, the so-called TREC evaluation. So TREC is the Text Retrieval Evaluation Conference. It has been going on for more than 20 years now. Uh, it includes many different uh, competitions uh, every year. Some of them involve uh, document retrieval, others involve blog retrieval, spoken document retrieval, and so on. Starting in 1999, there was a new evaluation called Q&A, which spearheaded a lot of the research in question answering systems for the next 10 to 15 years. So TREC is run by NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States. And uh, a very nice description of the system is available in the papers by uh, Alan Voorhees and Don Tice from 99 and 2000. The evaluation was specifically designated to deal with factual question answering using uh, a specific corpus, so not using the web. So the corpus was of news, about two gigabytes worth of it. Uh, that corpus was known as the Quain corpus eventually. Uh, and for the evaluation, uh, the first year, there were 200 fact-based questions. Uh, the next year, there were 693. So the work uh, for this evaluation essentially involved fact extraction, and it dealt with questions of this kind that had unambiguous answers. For example, uh, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State? Or what does the Peugeot company manufacture? So the assumptions were the following, that the questions are based on text, so the corpus was created by human analysts who actually read those documents and uh, found sentences that contain answers to the questions. So the systems were told in advance that the answers were uh, guaranteed to be inside the corpus. So the systems were supposed to return short passages, not necessarily the exact answer, but very short passages uh, in one of the tasks, 50 consecutive bytes, and, and the other task, they had to return 250 consecutive bytes. Uh, after a few years, uh, starting in 2002, there was only one single passage of 50 bytes that was supposed to be returned, but it had to be annotated with a confidence score, which was used in computing a confidence-based evaluation of the system, or it was also possible that the system could return the answer nil for a specific question if it was sure that uh, there was no answer to the question in the corpus. In all of those evaluations, there was no inference required, although some of the systems, a small sp set of the systems used some sort of inference. So let's look at track 1999 first. Here are some more questions from that corpus. I'm just going to go through them real quick here. What date in 1989 did East Germany open the Berlin Wall? So again, there's a single unambiguous answer, November 9th. Uh, who was Johnny Mathis' high school track coach? This is a famous question that has shown up in many papers on this topic. Uh, somebody called Lou Vasquez. Uh, what is the shape of a porpoise's tooth? Spade shaped and so on. So as you can see, there are different WH type of questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and so on. And the answers are very short passages that don't change over time. Okay, so you can look at some of those other questions on your own. So now some of the test questions. Again, just for your information, uh, who is the author of the book, The Iron Lady, a biography of Margaret Thatcher? What was the monetary value of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989? And so on. By the way, this entire corpus is available from the TREC website at nist.gov. Uh, if you're interested in uh, doing research uh, and evaluating your system against that corpus, you can download it from there. Okay, so I introduced the corpus and the general task description. Let's now focus on the evaluation metric that was used. So the most important metric used here was something called MRR, which stands for mean reciprocal rank of the correct answer among a ranked list of answers. So here's the formula for MRR. You take the rank of the correct answer, you take the reciprocal of that rank, so one point for first place, uh, half a point for second place, and so on, and you average this over all of the questions in the corpus. So this metric was first introduced by TREC in 99 and has been very popular in the Q&A community for all those years. So here's an example. Suppose that the question is, what is the capital of Canada? 
and you have a system that returns the following five answers in ranked order. First answer, Toronto, second answer, Ottawa, third answer, Albany, fourth, Philadelphia, and fifth, Ottawa again. So in MRR, you're only looking at the highest ranked correct answer. So in this case, it would be the second answer. Uh, at this point, you would get a score of 1 over 2, which is 0 0.5 points. You don't get any additional credit for getting Ottawa a second time in fifth place. There is a different version of MRR called TRR, or Total Reciprocal Rank, which gives you extra credit for uh, additional correct answers. In this case, it's a little uh, trivial because the answer is the same, but there are um, questions that have multiple correct answers, in which case it makes more sense to get credit for all of the correct answers. So in this case, being Ottawa being in both second and fifth place, the system would get a TRR score of one half plus one fifth equals 0 0.7 points. In this case, the maximum is larger than one, obviously. So in later years, uh, the confidence weighted score was uh, prevalent. In, the, in that case, uh, you were getting more points if you got a correct answer and you were also certain of it. You, you wouldn't get that many points if you got the right answer and you weren't certain. And you could lose potentially a lot of points if you gave a high confidence to the wrong answer. So let's look at some of the performances. I'm going to show you the best systems that were participating in that evaluation over the first few years. So in 99, the best systems were by uh, Symphony from Buffalo, SMU, uh, AT&T, IBM, Xerox Europe, University of Maryland. 2000 was, uh, again, SMU, ISI, University of Waterloo, IBM, City College, I'm sorry, Queens College. 2001, InsightSoft uh, from Russia, LCC, uh, the group that was spun off from SMU, Oracle and ISI. 2002, again, same ones, including NUS, which is the National University of Singapore, and so on. So those were the first few systems that uh, participated in each of those years. And, and every year there were more than 30 uh, participating systems. So what other types of questions were possible? Uh, in latter evaluations on the track, uh, the following were introduced. Definitional questions, for example, what is a bow weevil? List questions, for example, which states signed the U.S. Declaration of Independence? And also cross-lingual questions. For example, the questions could be in Spanish and the documents could be in English. And finally, series questions where uh, you have one initial question and then depending on the answer to that question, you get a different uh, follow-up questions. And you can, if you get one of them wrong, you're essentially unlikely to get the rest of them correct because you're essentially going off on a tangent. So here's some examples of series questions. Uh, the first question in the first series is what are prions made of? Well, you have to answer this question. And then the next question is, who discovered prions? So again, it's a question in the same thread. What researchers have worked with prions? And so on. The next category is, who is the lead singer musician in Nirvana? And then who are the band members? So at this point, the question doesn't even mention Nirvana anymore. You have to figure out that this is part of the same thread. When was the band formed? What is their biggest hit? What are their albums? What style of music do they play? A third uh, series, what industry is Rome and Haas in? Where is the company located? What is their annual revenue? How many employees does it have? And so on. And finally, what kind of insect is a bow weevil? What type of plant does it damage? What states have had problems with bow weevils? And so on. So now let's move on to the next topic uh, within question answering. Specific, what is the typical architecture uh, of a system that answers questions? So uh, one observation that I would like to start with is that many questions can be answered by traditional search engines. So for example, I can go to Yahoo search engine and ask a question such as, what is the capital of Nicaragua? Even though the Yahoo search engine is not officially a question answering engine, it can understand this question and it will give me the answer, which is that the capital of Nicaragua is Managua as one of the answers. Uh, even if a search engine cannot necessarily retrieve the answer to a question, it's still possible that it will return a document that contains the answer or maybe a snippet of a document that contains the answers. As you can see, each of the hits in modern search engines is associated with a short snippet that in often, in, in many cases, contains the answer to the question directly. 
So let's see what other approaches there are to question answering and what components are involved in, in the uh, system building. Here's the question. Uh, what is the largest city in northern Afghanistan? So how would you uh, answer a question like this? Well, first of all, you could probably look at the map, figure out what, where is Afghanistan, figure out which cities are in the northern part of the country, and then go perhaps to a table with their populations and figure out the populations of all of the cities in northern Afghanistan, and then figure out which one of those is the largest by population. Or you can go to a search engine and just type this directly as a question, what is the largest city in northern Afghanistan? In this case, uh, let me show you an example. I sent this uh, query to a search engine and I was able to get the top uh, seven uh, documents and the snippets that the system picked as representative of those documents given the query on the top of the page. So you can see very easily that this set of snippets contains a lot of answers, some of them correct, some of them incorrect, and certainly it contains a lot of city names. So here's one, Kabul, which is the capital of Afghanistan, which is not the right answer to this question, by the way. Here's some more, Panama City, which is not even in Afghanistan. Kano, which is also not in Afghanistan, somewhere in Nigeria. One more instance of Kabul and one of Gudermes, which is a city in Russia. So all of those are incorrect answers, even though they are cities. And then for the first time in the fifth passage, we have Mazari Sharif, which is uh, the correct answer. And it also appears, uh, albeit with a different spelling, uh, in the seventh passage, uh, okay? So the question here is, once we have run our query through the search engine and retrieved those passages, can we come up with a learning algorithm that would classify the candidate answers into good ones and bad ones, or at the very least rank them based on how likely they are to answer the question uh, that was asked? So here are the components that the typical system includes in addition to the IR component. So for the first step is a source identification. So what database should you be looking at? Should you be using a general web corpus or perhaps something more specific? So if a question comes about movies and actors, maybe it's better to just go and send this question to something like IMDB or Wikipedia rather than the entire web. Uh, it depends also on whether uh, the answer is likely to be contained in a textual source or in a semi-structured or perhaps a structured source, for example, a database. So questions about, for example, the population of a certain city or uh, the unemployment rate in a certain country in a certain year are probably better obtained from some sort of semi-structured or structured data set. Whereas more general questions are probably better answered by plain text, unstructured data uh, or text sources. So query modulation is a very important step. I'm going to describe it in more detail in the next few slides. Uh, here's the basic idea. We want to convert the natural language question into a query for that search engine because most search engines are actually not good at answering natural language questions. For example, they can easily get confused by the fact that there are WH words such as who. Uh, they may also automatically drop some important stop words such as of and the whereas they can actually be very important for the answer. For example, if I ask a question such as uh, who uh, said uh, to be or not to be, uh, the string to be or not to be consists entirely of stop words, so a search engine is very likely to drop them all uh, before uh, answering the query, in which case we're not going to get any correct answers at all. So query modulation is also uh, concerned with the correct syntax for the specific search engine. So for example, if a search engine allows you to include alternative ways to ask the same word, for example, using uh, vertical bars, you can convert the question who wrote Hamlet into either author or wrote, followed by Hamlet. So in this case, we can figure out that uh, if a person wrote a certain book, that person is the author of the book. And therefore, we're going to be looking for documents that contain the name of the book, but also contain one of the multiple ways, at least one of the multiple ways in which one can describe uh, the author of a book. So document retrieval is just finding the documents that match the queries. Uh, sentence ranking means that once you have identified the documents that contain the answers, you want to find which passages, possibly sentences or paragraphs, are most likely to contain the answer. 
So this is usually done by some sort of n graph overlap or some formula such as the copy formula, which uh, we are going to discuss in the information retrieval section. The next thing is once you have identified the right uh, passages or sentences, you want to identify the answers to those to the original question somewhere through uh, the sentences in those passages. Answer extraction involves a process called question type classification. So if the question is about a person, you want to identify the names of persons in the possible answer sentences. It also involves something called phrase chunking. So for example, if you have, uh, let's say, something about New York, then you don't want to separate the word new from the word York. You want to keep them together as part of the answer. And finally, you have answer ranking. So in answer ranking, you have a bunch of candidate answers that satisfy the criteria so far. They are of the correct type, they appear in sentences in documents that are relevant to the query, and so on. And now you want to figure out in what order to present them to the user to score the most points. So in the example before, uh, you don't want Cabo and Cano and Gudermes to appear uh, in the top of the list. You want uh, Bazar -e Sharif to be there. So some of the features that I use to, answer the, to rank the answers include the question type, the proximity to the query words, and also very importantly, the frequency. So if you get, let's say, 20 passages returned by the search engine as relevant to the query, and six of them contain the exact same answer independently, well, chances are that this is a very likely correct answer as opposed to something that appears just once. So let's now go through this entire pipeline with the example before. So the question is, what is the largest city in northern Afghanistan? We go through first query modulation. We convert this into largest or biggest. We keep the word city. We drop the stop words, for example, in, is, and the, and we add quotation marks around northern Afghanistan to indicate that this is a phrase. We don't want uh, cities that are in the northern part of southern Afghanistan or the northern neighbor of Afghanistan. We want the actual phrase northern Afghanistan to appear. Okay, now we send this modulated query to a search engine and we perform document retrieval and we get a bunch of URLs. Then we rank the sentences in those documents and we get the ones that are most likely to contain uh, the correct answer uh, first. Then we perform answer extraction. We identify the candidate noun phrases in this case, which are most likely to contain the answer. And finally, we perform answer ranking using machine learning. We identify that Mazari Sharif is actually the better candidate and leave good or mess in second place. So again, this is just an ideal representation of the pipeline. Let's look at some of those stages in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first one is question type classification. So in question type classification, uh, we want to identify uh, the type of named entity that will match the question that was asked. So for example, if a question is about the author of a book, we're going to be looking for answers that are people or authors or writers and so on. We're not going to be looking for names of organizations or names of uh, football teams and so on. So here's an example. Who wrote Anna Karenina? We're looking for a person or an individual or writer and not for uh, any of the other categories. Let's look now at two different taxonomies of uh, uh, question types. The first one is the so-called sync classes from IBM's answer selection system or ANSEL. It includes about 20 categories, which are categorized as uh, QA tokens or question answering tokens. The first one is something like place. It answers the question where. And an example of this category is in the Rocky Mountains. The next is country. So country can be the answer to a question where or a more specific question such as what country. And in that case, an answer could be United Kingdom. You can see that uh, the mapping uh, here is actually ambiguous. So where questions in the input can be mapped to either places or countries or states, and perhaps some other categories. Who questions can be mapped to persons, roles, organizations, and so on. So even though you can uh, look at the question word, you still don't know exactly which category of question you're looking for. So you, you have to allow for multiple possible categories uh, to be included in the answer selection process. So let me show you one more taxonomy real quickly. This is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, question type taxonomy. 
Uh, so it includes quite a few more question types than the IBM system. The first major category is entities, and that includes things like animals, body, uh, organs, uh, colors, uh, and so on. Then there is another category of abbreviations, uh, then descriptions, then different types of humans, uh, locations, and finally different numeric expressions, for example, dates and distances and money and ranks and so on. So some examples from the University of Illinois corpus. Uh, when did Rococo painting and architecture flourish? Well, this category is num numerical and then subcategory date. What country's national passenger rail system is called VIA? Well, this is automatically classified as a location country. Who invaded makeup? Well, this is again a human, uh, specifically an individual, and so on. So you can look at some of the other examples here. And uh, for more details about the way that the classification is actually done, you can look at the uh, UIUC papers on question classification. I specifically recommend the ones that are listed on this page here, Lee and Roth, and one more by Lee and Roth. And then uh, all, both of those refer to uh, a specific data set that includes both a, a training set and a test set of a few thousand different questions with their labels manually selected. And this corpus has been used in a lot of other papers for comparative evaluations. So we're going to stop here uh, and continue in the next segment with some techniques for question classification.